Aye. Hello. This is the last segment of Salvation by Faith, Not Works, In Search of Christian Pre Freedom, Ray Franz, page 205. He talks about how the some members of the governing body combated the suggestions that they needed to relax the stress upon field service. In one governing body session, where the matter of giving greater emphasis to pioneering came up, Lloyd Barry expressed concern at the attitude of young witnesses in the United States. He pointed out that in Japan, where he had for some years been the branch overseer, most young people among the witnesses went pioneering promptly upon graduating from school. And he added, in Japan, it's the thing to do. When given opportunity by the chairman to comment, I expressed my hope that this was not really the reason for those young people becoming pioneers that I hoped that if they did become such, it was out of love for God and the desire to be of help to others, but not because it was the thing to do. Missionaries who have served in Japan acknowledge that there is considerable peer pressure connected with much of the unusually high degree of pioneering done there. After listening to a number of strong statements about pushing pioneer service, including vacation pioneering as a virtual obligation where anyone's circumstances allowed for it, I again held up my hand and said that I thought that if this were truly the case, then we members of the governing body should be the first to set the example. I asked how many of us have, have been using our vacation periods to do vacation pioneering. We could do it, but do we? Let us not plead our age as a reason for not doing it, since in our publications we regularly present as fine examples aged persons who are in the pioneer service. If we do not do this ourselves, then why should we pressure other persons to do it? The expression produced some stares, but no comments. <laughs> the discussion moved on. <laughs> the making of certain works to be virtual works of law may give the appearance of great devotion to God and of zeal for the interests of his kingdom even as it gave such appearance in the time of the Pharisees. But stress on such works of law often actually reflects moral and spiritual laziness. It takes far more thought and effort, demands much more of the heart and mind, calls for a more thoughtful, balanced, and reasonable setting of personal example to build people up in faith and love so that the good deeds flow from hearts that are responsive than it does to make people feel under obligation or to create in them a guilt complex. The latter is the worldly, legalistic method, not the Christian way. Outward conformity is no true indicator of the genuineness of one's heart motive. Pressure to conform the programming of people's lives and time by channeling their thinking and efforts into specific activities designed to promote predetermined organizational goals. All of this only serves to ob obstruct and vitiate the spontaneity of service. That spontaneity is the natural result of faith and love that requires Christian freedom if it is to have full expression. Again, the memorandum by Robert Wallen illustrates these principles. On page three, he writes, quote, When we look at the standard that has been set, which in large part is the publisher's record card of time spent in the field service, for which it is difficult to find a scriptural precedent, where do we find the true measure of a person's devotion? Does it tell us the kind of a person the individual is? What is he like in the home with his family? What kind of help does he give to others? How does he conduct himself on the job? How much time does he spend shepherding? Does he do kind things for others? Does he walk uprightly, care for the sick, handle emergency situations in his life and in the lives of others in the congregation with love and care for others? In short, does that card really give us the true measure of a person, the measure by which we are judging the abilities, but more importantly, the spirituality of a person. That was the end of his quote. 
Uh, I have quoted from several respected men and their expressions of concern. Some wrote in response to a specific request from the organization for observations. There are many, many others who would have written similarly if given the opportunity. I think it is noteworthy that whether requested or unrequested, in every case their letters were not viewed as meriting meriting anything beyond the very briefest discussion by the governing body. And that includes the letter by Service Committee Secretary Wallen. Expressions of this kind were simply not what most of the men on the body wanted to hear. They did not line up with the organization's set goals and would have called for a marked change from the organization's traditional way of dealing with its members. In the decade or so since, these men expressed their concerns. In many cases, giving their scripture-based reasons, nothing has changed. No finger has been lifted. So his bottom line at the end of this extensive chapter is that the Watchtower too has inflexible traditions and that those traditions and policies take precedence over scriptural evaluation. Mm -hmm. There's there's no self-examination going on. There's no self-scrutiny in the light of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And in the next chapter, chapter 7, Ray makes an example of their badge doctrine, house-to-house -house ministry. Is there any potential here for evaluation in the objective light of Scripture? The last 40 years has said no. So the next chapter in Ray's book, In Search of Christian Freedom, is From House to House.